All right, guys, welcome to the Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, Dennis Benito. This is Zach Miller. We are talking case law today. It has been a couple of weeks. We've been in the field a lot out there teaching. Zach just did a class in uh, Kansas. I did one in Kansas. Did I just get back from Kansas? I don't even know where. Yeah, I just got back from Kansas City. I flew in. It was snowing in Kansas City. It was 74 in New Jersey. The, I, the irony is unbelievable. Um, but anyway, we have some topics of discussion we're going to go into today. We had a little bit of a discussion prior to this before we decided to speak on the issue to make sure we're on the same page and I understand it. And uh, Zach is the guy. So without further ado, Zach Miller. Good to see you. Glad to be here again. It's been a while. It has. Too long, Zach. It has been too long. We should too be- long. We long lost go- soulmates. <laughs> what are we, what are we seven years apart? You and I, uh, I think so. I think, so. I think that's what we, de- we determined. Yeah. I always went for older men. So. It's, it's it's very natural to me. Anymore. It feels very natural. All right, so um, where do you want to start? Um, well, since we were just talking about, it, I guess the this trooper two step debate. Ooh, I I got to tell you, this one is going to make people woo furious. Uh, and, and there is just people are just so set in their ways. And and by the way, before we go into this, we are very empathetic to the idea that some courts have been so seasoned in this. They, this is the way it's been done, that it's going to be a hard thing trying to convince them otherwise, because we know that a lot of legal professionals are having a hard time understanding what the law says. So we're making analyses of the situation, practical advice. But, you know, listen, if that's what they want you to do, then so be it. But we're just giving you an explanation of why it's not actually a smart idea and where it kind of falls and fails. So let's go into it. Many states, or a, a small minority of the states, believe that on a motor vehicle stop, before a voluntary consent can be achieved, they must perform this action, the, two, the trooper two-step, which is they tell them the, the traffic stop has concluded, they hand them back their documents, they turn off their lights, they take two steps back, and then reinitiate and re-engage on the side of the road to try to create a voluntary feeling environment for the consent only. And we'll try to peel that apart and try to get into, well, when do you have to do that? And the question I had just right off the top of my head now is, are they doing it so they don't have to argue reasonable suspicion? You know, that might be a tactic why it's being done. Yeah, I mean, so just so that everyone understands what we're talking about here, it's, it's a traffic stop. Or a, you know, just a traffic infraction. We uh, we want to now transition this interaction to a voluntary contact because we've completed the traffic matter, the mission of the stop. Uh, we have not. Well, let, let's assume for just argument's sake, we've not developed reasonable suspicion uh, of criminal activity to extend the duration of the stop. So our our last hope, if you will, to to continue to investigate this. I don't know hunch that we have perhaps. We need to transition from an investigative stop slash traffic stop into a voluntary contact. And then along the way, we may try to seek consent to search the vehicle. So let's assuming we don't have reasonable suspicion, because if I had reasonable suspicion, I wouldn't need to do this whole thing that we're talking about. There's no need to transition this into a voluntary contact because I've got reasonable suspicion to continue and maintain this stop. Um, so we're, we're now done with the traffic stop. My, my mindset is I want to transfer this into or trans, transition this into, an, into a voluntary contact. So how do I do that? Well, the, the test is I have to make, a re- make it appear objectively that a reasonable person would feel like they're free to leave. The, they understand the stop is over and, and they're remaining on scene as a purely voluntary act. Um, and as with all tests for voluntariness under the Fourth Amendment, uh, it is assessed under a totality of the circumstances. There is no one thing, generally speaking, that uh, will always make a contact involuntary, uh, in other words, a seizure, or will uh, always make it a, a, a voluntary contact. And, and that's, that's, the, that's where we are. That's what we're trying to determine. Telling someone... So the, the only the closest Supreme Court case that has addressed this issue is, is Ohio versus Robinette, uh, which is kind of a it's kind of an outlier of a case anyway. Um, it, I haven't read it in a while, but there's there's just not a lot to it. And, and I think the Supreme Court 
didn't really answer the question that the lower court, um, or that, excuse me, that the, the petitioner had presented. But the, the point is, the takeaway for this is that um, in Robinette, the Supreme Court said, we're not even required to say you are free to leave. The magic words, you are free to leave, are not a requirement to show that a voluntary contact has, has occurred. Um, I think it's a good idea. Uh, I can't think of a better way uh, one single thing you could do to, to show that this is voluntary than say you're free to leave. But so that's not even required uh, to say you're free to leave as long as everything else that we've done would make a reasonable person feel like they're free to leave. So what are some of the things? Obviously giving their documents back, uh, driver's license, registration, whatever we had. Um, if it's a summons or a warning, we're issuing that. You know, a reasonable person would think when these documents are given back to them, this the stop is concluded. One of the things that has evolved over the years, and I remember being taught this in my basic academy, was this notion of doing the trooper two-step. Um, so we've given all the documents back, and now we're going to demonstrate in a we're going to have a physical demonstration of a break in contact, where we uh, literally we turn around, we walk back to our car, taking a couple of steps, and then we turn back around and we reapproach the driver as if we're just resetting the entire. Uh, interaction. And that's that's what I understand the trooper two-step to be. Um, I have yet to read, and there's lots of cases out there, but I've yet to find a single case that says that is an absolute requirement to show that this is now a voluntary contact. It's a thing you can do, uh, but I don't know that it's required. I've yet to see it. Uh, if, if anybody's aware of a case, please email me, email Dennis. Let me know. Let me see it. Let me read it. Um, but I'd be highly surprised if there was such a case uh, out there. And, you know, just like anything else, when something is developed and it, it, it I don't know, I guess it passes muster in, in a courtroom, it becomes the norm. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are people who were taught this forever and performed it and created this this hectic issue now of, oh, it doesn't look like the last time. So now you got to start over again. We have to reset and say, and hopefully get a prosecutor smart enough, which is probably close to never going to happen. And say, no, it's just the truth. I mean, I, I don't care. You don't have to say it. I'll say it. Just the fucking truth. So, you know, to understand this stuff and, and apply it. And by the way, not only just a prosecutor who actually knows what you're talking about, but then to be in a position to argue such a case. Right. So, I mean, you may have some high end, maybe U.S. attorneys. And I'm saying because you're a U.S. attorney that you actually know what you're talking about. I'm saying the ones that they're shuffling around from district to district to argue the important stuff, like the three to five in the whole United States that they constantly have to move around. Like when they did the El Chapo trial, they brought like they went all over the country to find some real winners. You know, I think they only came up with three names out of all the U.S. attorneys. They found three they needed to come and argue and and convict El Chapo. So, um you know, to understand the factors of a voluntary consent and argue it correctly. And, and, and by the way, you know, we, this is the dynamic of this company. So I'm very comfortable being uncomfortable. We have said things against the status quo for years. We have urged things correctly. And boy, oh boy, are some people going to get their panties in a bunch over this one. Mark my words. And we're willing to have the conversation and explain it. And people just find themselves in my mind when I see us having this conversation, stomping their feet in frustration. You know what I mean? Just almost as, as um, you know, uh, irrational as some of these heated emotional protesters. You know what I mean? Like, could, could, could these, let's take Democratic, uh, Democrats and Republicans, you know, so over emotional that nothing gets resolved. You know what I mean? Is the country really being served well by our people in Congress and the House of Representatives? The answer is no, because they can't get along. Mm -hmm. I'm sure both sides have some good ideas where they could collaborate together, but they're so worked up on their emotions and their point. It's gotten so far down the line that there's just no resolution at the moment with the current people that we have. And I don't know if it's ever going to change, maybe not even our lifetime, you know what I mean? Because uh, I think it was a little bit better in the past, but it's gotten so off the deep end that it's just now common practice to, to behave that way. And, and the same thing with this. So we would love to have these conversations with, with, with folks who are uh, involved in police legalities and try to resolve some of the issues, but then you got to bring them to court and you got to convince a judge. And 
convince a liberal judge is another thing as well. I, I get that. I under, we're, so we're empathetic that we're not saying that we're saying, what is the reality of it? And, and Zach, I want to tell you, I've had this thought in my mind of, of instead of doing a trooper two-step, using your words very clearly to achieve a voluntary consent. As I, as I mentioned earlier, something along the lines of, okay, at this point now, I'd like to uh, request your consent to search the vehicle. Just understand. And again, I know that according to Schlein Club versus Bustamante, or like you call it, Bustamante, uh, we're not required to offer people the right to refuse for voluntary consent. But again, you and I are both in agreement that it's not a bad idea to do it. If you want to negate the trooper two-step, well, maybe add it, sprinkle these other factors that will help negate that physical dance that you have to do. Like, hey, look, uh, you got your summons or you're not getting a summons. Uh, what I'm going to ask you for is consent to search. You have the right to refuse it, just so you know. It is freely and voluntary. You do not have to agree. You don't have to provide consent. And again, I'm not saying for the states where they don't even require this whole dance. I'm saying to negate the trooper two-step, to get rid of it, to dissolve it. Going into a verbal explanation, I think, would be far superior than doing this, like, in my mind to think about. You ever see, like, when these birds do these mating dances? That's how I see it in my head, like, to have to do this thing and do this feathers and shit like that, right? Yeah, that's how I picture it in my mind. And I don't, I just don't, it's not necessary. It's just, it's just not, we can do, we can do the transition by staying at the driver's window the entire time. And, and we can accomplish it through our words and our, our act of giving the documents back, you know, telling them, look, you're free to leave. The traffic stops done. You've got all your documents back. Um, you know, if you would, if you, if you would be all right with you, would you uh, stay mind staying here for a minute or two and answer a few more questions, which could include, can I search your car? Um, and this is when we, really we don't a, have, when we don't have reasonable suspicion. This, yeah, this is assuming we don't have reasonable suspicion to, to, to continue this detention. If we have it, we don't, we, we don't need to do all of this. Uh, we can certainly ask for consent to search if, with reasonable suspicion. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But there's no, I can't think of a good reason why we would want to try and turn, show this as a voluntary contact, um, a non-seizure interaction when I, when I have reasonable suspicion. We can just skip this and go right to the consent question. And, and what I'm, yeah, what I'm going to say is, uh, through the years of the almost 20 years I'm in this business now, we know that most of the times police officers have reasonable suspicion, just don't know it or articulate it accordingly. So if you're asking for consent yeah. to search, clearly if you're running a radar unit and you're pulling people over who are for speeding infractions, it would be a moot gesture to merely request consent because you could. So people would always say to me over the years of teaching, like, well, you don't need reasonable suspicion to ask for consent. I said, well, why would you without it? You know what I mean? Like, I get what your state has interpreted, but why would you ask for consent if you didn't have any reasonable suspicion at all? So the problem is you're just not being able to articulate your reasonable suspicion well enough, hence the RES checklist. If you listen to this podcast, you can get it by sending an email to streetcoptraining at gmail.com and we will, you got to verify your law enforcement status. We will give you these resources to have to help you do your job better in the field. But we're back to this again of like, this big myth that we're debunking, um, you know, we go into reasonable suspicion now. Do you have to play the trooper two-step game for the consent to be considered voluntary? The best in the business act, just so you know, in the interdiction game, quote unquote, because obviously this, this company has a little bit of a proactive feel to it. We're not overall just interdiction, but we're proactive. These, these old timers, these guys, these uh, legendary people in this game, uh, and this is near and dear to their heart. And to say that it, it, it's not necessary is going to make some feelings get hurt. So let's talk about you. Ha you pull over a car. You have reasonable suspicion to believe you're in the presence of criminal activity. How would we get consent then? You know, and I and I, I again, I leave that up as an open ended question to let you answer it. Yeah, I mean, how would I get consent to search? Is, is that the yeah? I mean, I mean, I, I know the answer, right? I, I know the answer. I'm asking you to provide it. It's is is our is it a request? Are we we're going to want to look at the words that we use, the precise language that we use when we're uh, asking for permission to search the vehicle? Um, basically, the test is is it a voluntary consent, or, or is it free from any undue coercion? You know, there Arrest there coercion, is a degree right of coercion. yeah, there's there's coercion present in every police citizen interaction because you have a person in a position of authority. Uh, which is a police officer, and then you have a private citizen. So there is, there's that inherently coercive element, but that by itself uh, would not deem um, 
any consent to be involuntary. So it's the, the language that we use, you know, are we, do we have a whole bunch of officers surrounding this person when we're asking, you know, cause that could certainly uh, increase the level of coerciveness. Are we making threats? Are we making promises? Um, those kinds of things. It, it's a totality of the circumstances. The language is, is gonna be a really uh, important thing we're gonna wanna talk about, articulate. Uh, what, what precisely did we say? So a lot of things that the, the courts will take into account, obviously, psychological tactics, uh, ploy, subtle pressure of language, um, the right to refuse, um, you know, so what it comes down to is good communication. So, you know, if you if you are in a, a situation where you have reasonable suspicion and the person is not free to leave, I think where a lot of people, I'm going to back up just a second, a lot of people are going to get confused because they're reading the case law and a lot of the cases that have been brought forward to us have been cases where the police officer did not cite enough reasonable suspicion to continue and extend the traffic stop, then ask for consent. And what happens is, is once you go into an illegal detention, anything from that point forward is considered fruits of the poisonous tree, correct? Yeah, but if the detention itself is unlawful, uh, the consent given during an unlawful detention is almost always going to be deemed um, involuntary, invalid. Yeah. Yep. yep. Uh, on that level, What's the attenuation doctrine where we start talking about attenuating the, the arrest from that point forward? Uh, that means that if, if, cons if we're talking in the context of consent, uh, what attenu the attenuation doctrine means is um, consent could still be deemed valid, let's say in the presence of some kind of unlawful detention, if the consent was obtained um, far enough either in time or in, in circumstance away from the, the illegal detention. So um, some other, other intervening factors have come to light uh, since the unlawful detention that would deem the consent voluntary. It's actually, it's pretty complicated doctrine, but it's, it's referred to as the attenuation doctrine. Uh, has, have the circumstances changed enough since the unlawful detention uh, that would render the consent now voluntary? Well, what, are there times where a, an unlawful detention will turn back into a lawful detention? Uh, it, it could, yeah, if there's sufficient attenuation, there's, there's sufficient uh, non-unlawful or there are sufficient lawful activities and non-coercive events that occur. Um, the attenuation doctrine is, is an uh, exception to the exclusionary rule, uh, or attenuation is an exception to the exclusionary rule. There's a whole... I could do a two-day class on the operation of the exclusionary rule. There's so many exceptions and nuances to it. Attenuation is one of them. Okay, cool. Uh, I just didn't want to. I figured I'd throw that out there to see. Uh, yeah, I covered cases on attenuation, right? Like, there's a few. There's some out there. It's 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 a difficult in this context. Illegal detention followed by valid consent. Uh, it's difficult to sufficiently attenuate the consent from the. I think we've had, well, I think I read one where essentially stop was concluded and then some new information arose and then provided probable cause to arrest. And, you know, it just, everything got saved by that maybe minutes later. So does that make mm -hmm. sense? Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that could certainly be a circumstance. I don't, I don't know of a particular case off the top of my head. There's a couple of Supreme court cases that deal with attenuation. There was one, um, uh, I came out a couple of years ago, dealt with an unlawful stop, followed by a search uh, of the person that uh, discovered drugs or something like that. And it was sufficiently attenuated. And I, I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head. Uh, but there's a few of them out there. There's a few okay. of them out there. Um, now, as far as back to this, we have reasonable suspicion. We have a uh, looking to get factors considering a voluntary consent. And we believe uh, you and I are both on the same page here that if we can advocate and communicate correctly that this physical act of the trooper two step is not necessary. Correct. How would you, how would you ask for consent with reasonable suspicion? What would you suggest would be a lawful consent? Um, let's start with good communication and kind behavior and, and, and not feeling like you're dealing with the biggest dickhead cop in the world. That's probably a good place to start. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, just, just simple, simple, pleasant tones. I mean, and, and not implying that this is, regardless of what you say, I'm going to search the vehicle, search it. If it's a vehicle we're talking about, I'm going to search it anyway. Uh, that certainly would be coercive, whether that's true or not. Um, you know, if we're trying to show this is consensual, we, we 
we can't uh, imply that it doesn't matter what you're going to say, we're going to search it anyway. Um, it is simply asking, you know, do you have anything illegal in your vehicle? Uh, yes or no, or well, if they say no, then, you know, if that's, if that's all right with you, do I have your permission to search your vehicle, all of, the, all of its contents? Let's back up, because if they said yes, you would have probable cause well, to search the car. <laughs> search it, yeah, we, we don't really need to have this discussion. I mean, we can continue. I mean, I can have probable cause to search and still seek consent to search as well. Oh, that was a question I was asked it. recently. Do you think that's a, that's a wise idea? Yeah, I think I saw that as one of the questions in the Facebook group recently. Um, I can't think of a good reason not to. I mean, if so, if I have probable cause to search whatever the area it is we're, we're talking about, can I still ask for consent? Or should uh, you? Search it? Should I? I mean, I don't know that it's. I don't know that it's 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 a better to do it or not to to do it. I mean, it could give you if I did ask for consent and I do have probable cause already in my back pocket. It's and they do grant consent. Uh, now I have two justifications for the search. You know, maybe later on we're in a motion to suppress, and and one of them is is being challenged, either my PC or my consent. I kind of have it's a fallback. You know, there's 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 no reason you can't ask for consent, uh, and it doesn't affect the validity of the consent as long as I'm not when I'm seeking the consent, uh, implying to the person that I'm going to search the vehicle no matter what you say. So it's a foregone conclusion that would render the consent invalid but it may not it wouldn't affect the probable cause people would then tend to think that if they ask for consent it almost shows like there was no probable cause and you're just going to you know uh fraudulently do it anyway yeah i mean if i could see a defense attorney saying well why are you bothering to ask consent or does that mean you're questioning your probable cause and not necessarily i'm just i want a backup justification for the search you know it's uh, what as long about, as i like have probable and people think that that the refusal of consent to search could be a factor in trying to explain things. But the answer is, is the courts have said you can't take a refusal of consent to be considered a factor in the RES analysis, correct? Oh, that is absolutely true. Yeah, yeah, they're, so they're, they have a constitution, constitutional right to refuse. And right. That so that's not be... a factor you can document. You can't say, well, I knew he was dirty because he refused consent to search. Yeah, that's absolutely you can't. Yeah, you cannot use that as a RS or PC factor. Mm -hmm. I mean, Utah look, versus Strife is the case. I just looked at the one I was referencing earlier, the attenuation case, Utah versus Strife. Okay. Sorry. That's all good, man. I, I know what kind of guy you are. Um, and, and I'm the same kind of guy. I just don't have it at my fingertips at the moment. Uh, let's go back to, again, voluntary consent. I wanted to bracket up there. Uh, we Now we've discussed consent with probable cause and without it. You know, make your decision on it. I, I certainly, for me, I like the idea of backing it up but I also think you're giving some fuel to the defense. I would agree with you on that. It could be, yeah. And, and not, not only fuel to the defense, but you got fuel to the insecure supervisors, right? Who are reviewing these reports and the actions in the field and have no idea what they're talking about. I mean, yeah. it gives them an argument to be, to be made, but if I'm on solid probable cause footing and my consent was otherwise valid, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm willing to have that debate with someone. I'm confident in, in my justification. Unfortunately, in this profession, you know that the, the chain of command uh, and the power military feel of a police department often can just clam up any, any logical conversation immediately on pulling rank. You know what I mean? So yeah. yes, people, people have to deal with that and then struggle with that at times. Um, mm -hmm. Let's go back to this. So now we're, we're being a nice cop. We're, we're, we're offering now, how are you asking for a voluntary consent with reasonable suspicion on a and during the course of an investigative detention, i.e. motor vehicle stop. Um, like how, like what precise language would I use? Or? Well, would, let, let, would you consider it to be, we just got to take into account like knowing, intelligent, and voluntary would be three places that we're oh, good. Also, uh, consent. So this is where consent to search is different than a Miranda waiver. So uh, a, a waiver of your Miranda rights must be given knowingly and voluntarily. Uh, which means they have to know what their rights are. That's why we have to read the warning. I'm, I'm talking about Miranda. And then that we have to show that they, we didn't, uh, that the, the waiver of the right was a product of uh, a voluntary act. It wasn't forced. A consent to search, however, is not a waiver. The Supreme Court has held it's not a waiver of a right. Uh, that's what the Bustamante case was about. Uh, therefore, uh, in order for consent to be valid, uh, it doesn't have to be shown that it was given knowingly and voluntarily. We only have to show it was given voluntarily. If it was required to give it knowingly, then I would that would be required by uh, the Fourth Amendment to tell them they have a right to refuse. And we don't 
have to do that under the Fourth Amendment. Now, state law, some state law, you do have to tell them they have a right to refuse. Uh, it's not a requirement. It certainly would be a voluntariness factor if you did tell them they had a right to refuse right up front. Uh, it certainly would help your your uh, argument that it was voluntary. But again, like all consent questions, it's a totality of the circumstances argument. Um, I've never, as a routine, told people up front, you have a right to refuse. Uh, I just ask for consent to search. Now, if they ask, do I have to give you consent? Then yeah, I have to be truthful with them. And no, you, you do. If I'm trying to make this voluntary, then I have to tell them what the truthfully that you do have a right to, to refuse. But it doesn't have to be given knowingly and voluntarily, unlike a Miranda waiver. Mm -hmm. Well, Stu, some states differ yeah. in some what the requirement is. Some states do have a knowing element that they have to be informed, they have a right to refuse before we can get a valid consent. But that's going to be a product of state law, not uh, Fourth Amendment law. Yeah, see, like Florida, I think, is knowing and voluntary. New Jersey's knowing, voluntary, and what was the last one I said? Intelligent. Yeah, and yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think these are good factors to consider because, you know, when I, when we go along this line, we talk about how people ask me, how old do you have to be to give consent? And the answer is intelligent enough to understand that you're giving consent. Exactly. Yeah. So and both of them have to, they both have an intelligent element to them. Yeah. You have to know what it is that you're consenting to. Well, yeah. Florida v. Gimino, right? Let's take Gimino, for example, and the factors that, that, that they assessed. People say, well, I, you know, I said, look, it's not a bad idea to go into a detailed consent. You don't be overly detailed. But at least detail more than, can I search your car? I, I advise, hey, we're going to be searching your car. That's everything inside the vehicle, bumper to bumper, all items and content to include locked items inside the vehicle. This way, you don't got to go back and stop under the Gimino rules and say, we found the lock this. Can we open it? Right. Um, I have seen, I'm sure you have as well, that there have been some consents in some districts or some states that were so vague that they've lost things going into under the hoods, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's got to be reasonable to believe that whatever, whatever your area you're getting ready to look, look in is within the scope of the consent the person gave. And the more vague and broad your request is, uh, that leaves a lot more gray areas as to uh, locations you could be looking, a lot more ammunition for an argument that that particular area you're searching is not within the scope. So yeah, I do like uh, more precise requests, uh, your vehicle and all of its contents, or like you said, you know, bumper to bumper and something along, something along those lines. I like the, I like the locked items language as well. Sure. Because we talk, Jimino, if you read, you know, obviously Jimino authorized the opening of containers, but not locked ones, right? So that was essentially, if you look at the Florida, the ruling, and I don't think the U.S. Supreme Court was asked to interpret that. Uh, I think they interpreted some things on that, but um, that was, you know, because people say, well, I don't, I read the U.S. Supreme Court ruling. They didn't talk about the lockdown. I go, you got to go back to the Florida case and what it dealt with. Mm -hmm. And they had gone into a locked briefcase there. And that essentially was the issue. Um and, it, you know, I, you know, I haven't read the Gemini in a little bit. I just know the premise of it. I advocate on it because it's a good idea. And by the way, some people will say, well, hell, I've been getting away with these consents. For I understand that, right? I'm not saying that I am forewarning you if you, if you, this is just good practical advice in the field to use that will, will make you feel a lot more comfortable when you're sitting the, the 14 minutes before your suppression hearing, reading your report going, oh, God. I should have listened. Fuck. Right. Like, damn it. I hope this, hopefully this is one of the 98 and a half percent of attorneys who have no idea what they're doing. And, and I can just skate through this one. And, and some of the ones who have no idea what they're doing still will try to play the game of, this is not a game of law. This is going to be a game of me trying to make you look an ass. And that's yes. like, you know, there's nothing more exciting for me. Um, and I don't get to litigate in court. I was never really on trial, but maybe maybe prior to going to the courtroom, there were meetings with defense attorneys, and I just really enjoy as they come in with their bravado and their their slick behavior, just eating them for breakfast with knowledge. I don't know of one, honestly, who was smarter than, and I I don't mean this, that I'm the hottest shit in the world, who knew more about Fourth Amendment than I did, uh, or even close to it. Uh, okay, let me go back. Article 1, paragraph 7 of the New Jersey State Constitution and it's applicable laws to motor vehicle um, stops and consents and probable cause. 
you 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 had guys who couldn't understand. I mean, it, it was just I mean, you would just could not. They could not comprehend. You, these are attorneys. Like we're going to trial. I'm like, oh my god, you're gonna you're dead. What on what premise? On what grounds? Like we're gonna argue this. I would literally tell them like, you keep, but you, there's no argument there. I'm gonna argue this back. Like you want just. Let the guy plea out. What are you crazy? He's looking at five years in prison, or, a, uh, or, or you know, or three months and five years pro- probation. You're gonna, you're gonna lose. Like, and you know, the prosecutors are like, well, look at this. I love having this guy here. Yeah, because I know the law. Um, and again, I'm not trying to say I'm this this expert. I, I, I have a lot of humility with that. But when we look at things from an arbitrary standpoint, we're looking at stuff and it's like, where does this make sense? You know. So good factors to consider in a, in a voluntary consent are intelligent, you know, who is the person you're dealing with? Um, we, I think we talked about it on one part of the podcast, can somebody who's been ingesting some kind of intoxicant give consent? And the answer is yes. It just depends how intoxicated they are. Absolutely. Right. It's so if you had three beers, I'm buzzed. Do you have enough knowledge to give me consent? And I would argue, sure, you passed FSF, uh, SFSTs. But if you're a two, three, and we're holding your hand up to sign a form, you're going to have issues with that kind of consent. But how about somebody who's under the influence of heroin, but is a heroin or illicit drug user, and that's their normal state of, of uh, mens rea, right? Look at me pulling these big-ass words. Um, is a guy who did nine bags of heroin every single day for the past three years in a culpable state to give good voluntary consent versus maybe somebody who did it for the first time? Sure. You know what I mean? They make a lot of their whole life's decision is around their functioning alcohol. How about a functioning alcoholic? You know, a lot of things you have to take into to consider. And then you have to know what you're consenting to. It, it's no bullshit. Two, two classes ago, I said, a uh, driver has no right to consent to the personal belongings of passengers. And this guy's like, where does it say that? I'm like, well, do you think you could walk down the street and point at people and say, officer, you can search that lady's pocketbook over there. And he goes, no. And I said, so why do you think you could do it in a car? Well, I said, listen, I- I'll provide case law for you, but let's start using some common sense here. You can only consent to what is yours or at least show mutual ownership, right? Yes, you have to at least, you have to have some common authority over the yeah, item. I, right, I, I don't part. know that we need a case to say you can't give consent to search something you don't have any interest in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, guys, just have, guys and girls have to get better with understanding what the law says. So that's, and then being descriptive of what you're searching. Uh, you know, we talk about it in class. Hey, I think it's a great idea to pat frisk people, but I think if you're going to do it uh, and you don't have the prerequisite, even if you have the prerequisite, you know, outside of something being very, very dangerous, uh, ask for consent. And people say, well, what do I get to search? I go, what you asked for, a weapon. You want to search further? Ask for a contraband search and explain what that is. Do you have any contraband on you? Would you mind if I check your your pockets uh, and your shoes and your belts to ensure that you don't have narcotics on you because I'm suspicious. Very different, two different consents. Would you agree? Yeah, asking for consent to frisk someone and they say yes, that's a very limited and uh, limited consent. You're limited to what what the common understanding of a frisk is, which is a pat down for weapons. Yeah, yeah and I think that I think that just interchanging the word of can I check you for contraband is a far different interpretation. Sure, sure. I so, agree. I agree. So we're there with that one. And then we go into the behavior of the police officer, uh, polite, calm, non-coercive, relaxed environment. Um, you know, that, that's another good one. Then, mm-hmm. you know, knowing and explaining correctly, like, don't forget, your game is to show that it was truly voluntary. And, and really, if guys and girls really want to know what that means, my best advice is to go into your state's case law and read which ones were good and which ones were bad. Would you agree it's a, that's a good piece of advice? They're all, they're fact specific. Yeah, you have to, and, and a good point you mentioned is we have to prove it was voluntary. He does not have to prove it was involuntary. So burden of proof is on us. So all of these things, it's on, it's on us to uh, be able to articulate what it is that we said and what were the, the attendant circumstances surrounding the, the consent. Burden's on yeah. us. And by the way, like if we're getting to a point in a consent where it's not feeling voluntary, you're going to take other, other, you know, if you have other actions that you can take, like, let's say you're in a traffic stop, you have reasonable suspicion and somebody is now starting to make it feel like the consent is not voluntary. Like, well, I don't want to, but like, I will, well, hold on a second. You have options here. And the options, we're going to call for a canine to sniff, which I, I think should be one of your last options. But two is 
well, let's explain, let, let's elaborate further. What is your concern? Let me help you make your best decision. Ask me whatever questions you want regarding this consent. Now, by the way, on a quick side note, when people start to play this game, especially after five, six minutes of comfortable conversation, there's probably drugs in the car, okay? Or some kind of contraband they don't want you to see. Although you can't make it a factor, you know, just take that little one, stick it in your little, in your little feather in your cap there. Now, you may be able to continue to elaborate further, but at some point, if somebody is now trying to show apprehensiveness and they may know the system a little bit, you may have to try to uh, go to a different route and, and consent may not be an option. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. If, if, if it's ambiguous or, un- or equivocal in some way, wavering, uh, that you know, the burden of proof is on us. And when it's uh, a 50-50 toss-up, which way it could be interpreted, we're going to lose that one uh, all day. So we were looking for an unequivocal yes or no, right? Yeah, clear. We have to. It's clear what it is that they're saying. Yes, they're you understand consenting. you're consenting to this search, correct, sir? What is your highest level of education? Do you read, write, and understand the English language? Is there anything that I'm asking you that you are not comprehending at all? I just need to know that because I don't want you doing things that you don't want to do. And you're getting people saying, I know what I'm doing. Okay. What a great way to show up in court with a video that says, I know what I'm doing. I, we've had that. Like, look, dude, I've been down to prison three times. I know, I know exactly what, I know that you guys have a dog and if I don't give you the consent, you're gonna, and then the best is when you can just finally get somebody to say, you know what, there's there's cocaine in the car, okay? Well, now we're in a position where we can, now we can arrest on the admission, right? We're at a whole nother playing level now. Yeah, now we can make an arrest on the admission, we could search incident to arrest and then we could search the car, is that correct? Correct, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. And again, we talked about this in the last podcast, if you don't find that cocaine in the car, maybe it was a bluff, we were going to unarrested that junction, maybe try to find clarity, like where is that cocaine in the car? But yeah. at that admission, when you're asking for where is the cocaine, do you have to stop and read Miranda now? After he just admitted it? No, he's because he's not in custody. He's not, you know. What if you place him under arrest and say, where is the cocaine? So it was just- yeah. Yeah, well, Under arrest is the quintessential custody for purposes of Miranda. Yeah, once he's, the magic words, you're under arrest or, or the handcuffs come on, uh, it's it's going to be arrest custody. A lot of times see custody. if somebody is under the belief, a reasonable person would believe that they are not free to leave in a full blown custody situation. Is that the is that the analysis of when Miranda is actually going to kick in? Um, not on the side of the road. So the, the test for Miranda is a situation where a reasonable person would feel as though he's under arrest or physically restrained to the degree normally associated with arrest. What if you yeah. have uh, you found a pound of cocaine in the car? You throw it on the hood and you look at the guy. Would you agree that it's probably a good time to start reading Miranda if you're going to question? There, yeah, it's now just like consent to certain. This is a whole other discussion that we'll have on another day. I've actually got notes to, uh, to myself that we need to talk about this. Um, but just like consent to search, Miranda custody is a totality of the circumstances test. Um, when someone is being confronted with evidence of their guilt, that is a factor. Uh, it's probably a pretty strong factor. Um, something would a reasonable person think that if I confessed to possessing that big brick of cocaine that's laying on the, the hood right there, would a reasonable person think that jail is imminent? Uh, that's probably a yes. Then uh, we're very close, if not already at Miranda custody. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's, that's a strong factor. It's not necessarily determinative, but it's a strong one. And you could mitigate some of that. And we'll go into this next week. I don't want to go too far on a tangent here, but I would imagine you could mitigate some of that with like, Hey, what I found so far is enough to just go on a summons, just so you know. Yep. Yep. And you would be able to mitigate knowing that they would be released from the scene. Correct. Because Miranda did arrest custody. Getting ready to go to jail is the test, really. You know, and somebody had argued, um, I might have been you that said, like, well, I don't want to give them the ability to have that scapegoat of reciting Miranda too early. And And my advice for newer people is if you're going to go down that road of trying to elicit a response or a confession, and you don't know when that time has occurred, when you think you're there, it's probably not a bad idea to read it. Uh, I'd rather have it than not. I see a a smile on your face. I'm a big proponent of learning the law of Miranda and only reading Miranda when it's required. Now, I agree. It is not wrong. You, there's, you're not going to create a legal problem if you read Miranda early. Um, generally, there's, there's a couple of arguments to be made in a different context. But um, it's not wrong legally. But to me, from an investigative standpoint, 
I'd prefer not to have to tell someone they don't have to talk to me unless I have to tell them they don't have to talk to me. Um, I call them Miranda gift bags. Uh, I'm not a proponent of handing them out. You have to earn it. You have to find yourself in Miranda custody. Uh, and it's not that hard of a rule to learn, uh, but it is widely misunderstood. There's no question about it. And, and it's the misdirection of most people who are providing advice who have no frigging clue what they're talking about. It's not just police officers that misunderstand it. It's lawyers, judges. There's there's a lot of misunderstanding. Of who, I mean, think about this. Who even knows what, like, in the legal sense of legal professionals, we're talking about this stuff. Or, or I'm going to even go one step further and say professionals in the law overall of every facet and division of law there is, how many actually understand, interpret, and apply the law appropriately and properly? And the answer is, if it was everybody, we wouldn't need an appellate division or a Supreme Court. Yeah, if, you're, if every trial judge got it right every single time, right, we wouldn't need um, we wouldn't need our appellate courts. Yeah. To, so it's to, built into the law to know that judges are going to be wrong. Sure. Yeah. Now, a lot of these things are, are judgment calls in, in all facets of the law. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I think we've covered it. I don't. I, we'll go into de facto arrest next week. It's not important for this week. Uh, it's just one of those mythologies that circle law enforcement about the use of handcuffs and it taking in a, uh, a lawful detention into a de facto arrest or an illegal arrest. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we've covered anything else we want to cover regarding getting lawful consent. Um, I think I want to wait till next week uh, to talk about this. So I, you mentioned I was in Kansas a couple weeks ago and it was a, we had a, had a great group out there, some Kansas and some Missouri officers. Uh, we had, a, it was a, my constitutional law class. We had a great two day, uh, class and, and some really good questions were brought up by some of the folks in the group. Uh, and one that really intrigued me was this notion of can, can, can I get valid consent to search during a traffic stop? So we're, in, we're still in the, uh, the traffic matter part of the stop. Can I get valid consent? Uh, and we're going to talk about that next week. You want to address that now? We can do it now. Well, it's actually going to be a pretty, I got quite a bit I want to talk about. And I want to, I want to say about it. Because I want to go, it, it's I'm going to go back to Terry versus Ohio, um, the Supreme. We're, go, we're going into Zach Miller territory. We're I love this. Do, we're going to do some deep legal talk about this topic, uh, and and just kind of the teaser is that Kansas is the only state where I've found under the Fourth Amendment, you cannot ask for consent without reasonable suspicion on a traffic stop. Uh, the, un, again, under the Fourth Amendment, there's lots of other states that have an RS requirement, but that's under their state constitution. Uh, and just, I think Kansas is correct. Uh, the Supreme Court has been less than clear uh, on this issue. And that's what I want to pick up with next week. Excellent. Well, I will get one of those camelback water things to sit and my popcorn. I'm going to let you go because it. this get is my favorite. Get comfortable and we'll... Uh, We'll dive in. I like I like when like people show up to the to the Zach battle with like a little like dagger and Zach pulls out like the biggest fucking sword in history and just lays it on the table. And it just makes me so happy. I'm glad you're on my side. Well, and uh, the key is I think one of the keys is I, I, I take emotion out of these things. I mean, people get so emotional about some of these legal points. And you know, it's, if you just take the emotion out and look at look at what the law is and try to be objective. You know, I'm a police officer, but I don't think I'm pro police when it comes to looking at, I try to be objective when I look at a, a legal case. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you when I think the Supreme Court's wrong in a quote pro police case uh, as a matter of constitutional law. Um, so I, 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 I pride myself on being objective to the best that I can, but I'm, I'm human, everybody, everybody, has their own biases and, 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 and I'm a police officer at the end of the day. So I have that bias of seeing things through the lens of a police officer, but I, I try to be objective and unemotional on these legal issues. And we're going to do that. Thing. next. Even, even with political issues, I try to understand where the other side's coming from. Uh, I don't go down the path very often with political issues. I will only. Agree with them. Yeah, you don't have to agree with them, but just at least hear where they're coming from. Yep. yep. The cases don't go to the, the Supreme Court doesn't take easy cases. How about that? There's there's a good reason why a case is in the Supreme Court. That means there's two good arguments, one on each side of the issue. That's why it's there. And I try to see both of them. And sometimes the court gets it right. And sometimes I don't I don't think they do. 
Well, I respect your opinion. And uh, streetcop.com is our website. You can also check out all of our upcoming training there at the Street Cop Conference, October 4th through the 8th, 2021. What a lineup. <laughs> Zach Miller will be there. Uh, going to learn how to floss, and he's going to do a, a dance routine on stage, similar to the one that we saw in Napoleon Dynamite. That's what I've been. That's what I've been told, Zach. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm keeping it under wraps. All right, yeah, the oh, surprise us. We'll be looking forward to it. Um, Zach's group, Constitutional Policing, or his class, I'm sorry, Constitutional Policing, is available, and we have upcoming dates on the website. Facebook group, Street Cop Training, where we do a lot of this video content, a lot of stuff. We try to answer a lot of questions. We are doing the best that we can and trying to uh, clear up a lot of this confusion and cloudiness in law enforcement. So without further ado, it was great having you this week, my friend, and I will see you next week. See you next week. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you liked what you saw, subscribe to our channel or leave a comment below and also like us too. It means the world to us.